So we are very delighted to have Professor Maskin here with us once more. He has been here like three months ago, actually to talk about a completely different subject, which was, uh, you all remember, globalization and income inequality. Uh, and now he's going to teach us and to talk informally with us about voting systems. For those of you who do not know the details of his academic trajectory, Eric Maskin holds education of mathematics from Harvard, applied mathematics from Harvard, and PhD from Harvard. Several academic positions, several fellowships, grants, and awards, including the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics with Herkwitz and Meyerson in 2007, I was looking for a resume, a, a, a short vita of, uh, but I, I, I couldn't find it. And so it's uh, absolutely uh, amazing, uh, the, his whole curriculum. So, but most important than all these things, he is, and I, 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 I hope I can say so, he's a friend of our school. A uh, friend of Epigea. He has, he's always ready to talk with the students. Uh, he has met the undergraduate and postgraduate students twice when he was here before. He met the students today. The students could very informally talk to him about research, what is research about. And uh, he is always very kind and uh, dedicates, dedicates and has been dedicating a lot of times, a lot of his time to our students and to our faculty as well in exchanging informations. Today, uh, I handed over to him a contribution to his contribution because in 19, I think 86, he wrote a very important seminal article about uh, existence of equilibrium in discontinued games. And that has been afterwards improved by uh, Philippe Reny, uh, but later that has been improved by our colleague and professor of our EPGE, Paulo Klinger Monteiro. So you see how things developed in academia with people in different places of the world in different times contributing to one another. So, Eric, uh, we are really very happy that you have been so kind with us all these times and that you share not only the time, not only the ideas, but mostly uh, being here with us is, is, is very important because it transmits to a lot of people how you praise uh, sharing what you have learned along all these years. So please join me in applauding Eric Maskin. So thank you very much, Rubens, for that, that lovely introduction. It, it, is the microphone working? How, how's this? Can you hear me? Uh, it's, it's very uh, nice to be back in Rio uh, and uh, at the graduate school. Uh, I, as Rubens said, I, I was here in March. I had a great time, and so it's... Uh, it, it's a, a lovely opportunity to come back so soon, uh, and I hope uh, I will be back here many times in the future. Uh, what I thought I would uh, talk to you about today uh, is some, some work that I've been doing on voting. Uh, you might not think of voting as being part of economics, but, but I think it is, and, and I think you will see uh, soon why the same kinds of principles that economists uh, concentrate on also apply in the political realm. Uh, I should say that the work that I'm talking about is, is joint work with Partha Dasgupta. Uh, Rubens mentioned another paper that I uh, 
wrote with, with Partha many years ago. Uh, I, uh, the collaboration I've had with Partha over the years is one of the great pleasures of, uh, of my career. Uh, so uh, what is this paper about? Well, it's about voting rules. Um, a voting rule is a way of going from uh, the preferences of voters over candidates to the outcome of the election. So given the preferences of the voters, which candidate should be the winner? Which candidate should be the uh, should, should be elected, uh, uh, a voting rule determines which is the winning, which is the winning candidate. And there are lots of examples of voting rules that ha are used in practice and have been studied in theory. And I will mention just a few of them. Uh, one um, important example. Uh, is, um, is plurality rule. Uh, this is the method that is used in the UK for electing members of parliament. It's used in the United States for electing members of Congress. Um, and the way it works is that only voters' top-ranked candidates matter. So. Uh, we look at each voter's favorite candidate, and the winner is the candidate who is the favorite of more voters than any other, uh, even if that candidate uh, does not get a majority of first place votes. So that's uh, that's uh, plurality rule. I, I, I should say that uh, there will be time for questions at the end of my talk. But if you don't understand something I've said, uh, if I lose you, please let me know right away. Because if you if you miss one step of of the argument, then everything else is not is is going to be meaningless. So so do stop me if you can't follow something I've said. Uh, so plurality rule is used a lot. Uh, another method which uh, is majority rule, uh, it's also called Condorcet's method, will be one of the uh, heroes of my story. I, I, as you will see, there, there will be some, some uh, strong arguments for using majority rule. How, do, how does that work? Well, uh, in majority rule, every voter submits a ranking of candidates. So you don't just vote for one candidate. You submit a ranking, perhaps, of all of the candidates, or at least as many of the candidates as you want to rank. And then the winner is the candidate who beats each other candidate by a majority in pairwise comparisons. So that's majority rule. Uh, then uh, there's runoff voting, which uh, was first used in France, but actually this is the method that you use here in Brazil for, for electing uh, presidents as well. Uh, under runoff voting, uh, you first look at voters top-ranked alternatives, top-ranked candidates. And it, if there is some candidate who gets a majority of the top ranks, that's the first round, then that candidate is elected. But usually what happens is that there's no candidate who gets a majority in the first round. And so we go to a second round where the two candidates who are ranked first the most both go into the, into the runoff. And whoever gets a majority there is elected. So that's, that's runoff voting. Uh, then 
Uh, then there is what's called rank order voting, uh, or uh, the board account. Under uh, rank order voting, which is often used by committees, say, to elect a committee chairman, um, voters submit their rankings. And then every time a candidate is, is ranked first by some voter, the candidate get, gets one point. If you're ranked second by a voter, you get two points. You get three points if you're ranked third, and so on. And then uh, we add up all of the points that a candidate gets from all the voters. And whichever candidate gets the fewest points is elected, because getting a low number of points means you're more highly ranked. Uh, you've probably used rank order voting at one time or another. It's, a, it's actually quite commonly used, uh, again, mainly by uh, small committees. Um, and then the, the, the final voting rule that I'll mention, you might not be thought of as a voting rule at all. Um, and there are good reasons why in practice, this is not used as a voting rule, but, it, but it's, a, it's an idea which economists often talk about. It's the utilitarian principle. Uh, it, it, if you think of each voter as having a utility for each candidate, you can think of the candidate that maximizes the sum of utilities. That would be uh, the utilitarian voting rule. Um, I will come back to this later because the, the question arises, why don't we do this in practice? There, there's a very good reason. Uh, but at the moment, it, it looks as though it's, it's a perfectly legitimate voting rule. Well, I, I've mentioned uh, five different voting rules. I could have described many, many more. In fact, there's, there's literally an infinity of possible voting rules. And out of this very large number of voting rules that we could use, the question is, which one should we use? Which one should we actually adopt? Well, the, as a voting theorist, I, I claim that the answer to that question depends on what you want a voting rule to accomplish. So one way to try to answer the big question, what voting rule should you adopt, is to, fer is to break it down into the question of what, what would we like a voting rule to do for us? What, what properties would we like it to satisfy? Um, and there are some standard properties that any good voting rule should satisfy. And then we can ask which voting rules best satisfy those criteria. Uh, and that's, that's how I would like to proceed this afternoon. Well, one, one important uh, criteria and one important property we would like a voting rule to have is what's called non-manipulability. Uh, my, my, my title uh, this afternoon is elections and non-strategic voting. Uh, sorry, elections and strategic voting. Non-manipulability is the opposite of strategic voting, where voters don't vote strategically. In, in other words, um, voters, if the, if the voting rule is non-manipulable, voters will not have an incentive to misrepresent their preferences. They will not have an incentive to vote strategically. Uh, now, why, why do we think that this is a good idea, non-manipulability? Uh, I think there are at least two reasons why non-manipulability is important. Uh, the first is that if we have a voting rule which satisfies all the properties we want of a voting rule, except non-manipulability, then, in fact, voters will not be submitting their true preferences. They will be 
submitting some other preferences. And so all of the properties that we thought held for the voting rule will, will be distorted. If, if you distort the inputs to a process, the, the preferences, you're going to distort the output, the winner of the election. So uh, one reason why we want non-manipulability is uh, to make sure that we're actually implementing the voting rule that we thought we were implementing so that we don't get distortion of preferences. Uh, but another reason which I think is just as important is that strategic voting is hard for voters. If, I, if I'm a citizen voting for the president of Brazil, for example, what I will want to do before the election is to spend some time looking at the different candidates, evaluating their positions, looking into their backgrounds. It takes a certain investment of time and energy to be a good citizen and to uh, decide for yourself what your ranking of the candidates is. But if a voting rule is manipulable, if, if, it's, uh, if, uh, if it pays to be strategic in your voting, then what you need to do as a voter is not only know your own preferences, but you have to make a forecast about other voters' preferences because you have to know how to react to their votes. So strategic voting means that your decision problem as a voter is much more complicated. You have to, uh, you have to anticipate how other voters are going to vote before you can figure out how you should vote. Because, because uh, you d for example, you don't want to vote for a candidate who has no chance of winning. Uh, but you can only calculate that the, that the candidate has no chance of winning once you make some evaluation of how other people are going to vote. So voting rules that are non-manipulable make life simpler for voters. Uh, they don't have to worry about how other voters are going to vote. Unfortunately, there is a basic negative result uh, in voting theory uh, called the, the Gibbard-Satterthwaite theorem. Uh, some of you may have heard of this. Uh, basically, it says that if there are three or more candidates running for office, then there is no voting rule that is always non-manipulable, uh, except, except for rules which give all of the power to one voter, so that only one voter determines the outcome. The, the, those are non-manipulable, because the, the one voter who has power has no reason to distort his preferences, and the other voters have no influence, so they have no reason to distort any, anyway. But di dict dictatorial rules are not very democratic, and so this is a very uh, negative result. I would argue, though, that it's overly negative. It, 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 it overstates the, the gloomy side of the story, uh, and that's because the gibbard Satterthway theorem insists that a voting rule never be manipulable. Uh, but some cases where a voting rule might be manipulable could be very unlikely, and so maybe we don't care about those very much. Um, what, what it seems to me is the important question is, uh, which voting rules are non-manipulable most often? Given that we can't find a voting rule which is always non-manipulable, how close can we come to the goal of non-manipulability? That seems to me the, the natural follow-up question, and that's what, uh, that's what we try to 
uh, answer in this paper, that question. So, so this, I hope, provides some motivation for the uh, analysis that follows. So let, let me show you uh, the, the framework, the model that we use to answer this question. Uh, and in many respects, if you've seen some voting theory or you've seen some social choice theory before, you will find every, just about everything I say to be completely familiar. Um, so let's imagine, first of all, that there's a set of possible candidates. Uh, the, these, are the can the, these are not just the candidates who are actually running for office. These are all of the candidates who could conceivably run for office. So it's, it's the universe of possible candidates. Uh, and I'm going to assume that society is very large. Uh, and I, I'll explain why I'm assuming this in a few minutes. So th this is actually the only slightly non-standard assumption. Uh, I'm going to assume that society is very big, uh, which formally speaking means that society consists of a continuum of voters. Uh, and I'll explain why very soon. Um, so each voter can be described by a utility function. A utility function assigns a utility to each candidate. And higher numbers, higher utilities, correspond to more preferred candidates. And uh, just to make life simple, I'm going to assume that these utility functions are strict, which means that a voter is never exactly indifferent between two candidates. So we can, describe, we can describe a society by a profile. A profile is, which I'll denote by, uh, whoops, is there a laser pointer here? I, actually, I've got, I've got a laser pointer in my, uh, no, no, I, I I've got a laser pointer on my back. So, so you, you box. So, so the box is a, is a dummy variable to represent uh, the, in, all of the voters' eye. So, so U-box specifies a utility function for each voter. So U-box is what I'll call a profile. It's a description of all of the voters' utility functions. And now a voting rule is a way of going from a profile, a description of voters' utilities, uh, to um, a winner. Uh, but the, uh, the winner will depend, first of all, on the, uh, the set of candidates who are actually running. So I said that capital X is the set of all candidates who could conceivably run. The candidates who actually are running are the, are the set Y. So we'll call that the ballot, the, ca the candidates who actually appear on the ballot, and a voting rule chooses a winner from the ballot depending on the uh, voters' utility functions and, and, of course, the ballot. So, so F is the, the winning candidate or the optimal candidate. Now, what I've said is not quite right because under all of the voting rules that I described, there could be a tie. If we were using um, plurality rule, for example, under plurality rule, um, we choose the candidate who gets the most first place votes. But there may not be a unique candidate who gets the most first place votes. There could, there could be a tie. 
The point is that in a, uh, in a society with many voters, the chance of having an exact tie is very low. In, in, in practice, it never happens in a, in a society as big as Brazil's or even a society uh, as, uh, as big as some American states. The, uh, the, uh, the technical way of expressing that is to say that with a continuum of voters, ties are non-generic. And so uh, the correct definition is that a voting rule chooses a unique winner for a generic profile, for, uh, for, for almost every profile of preferences, we, 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 we will not have a tie. OK, so uh, given, given this model, I, could, I can now formally define all of the voting rules that I discussed. I'm not going to go through the, those formal definitions because I think uh, my informal description suffices. But if anyone is interested in any of this uh, ma mathematics later on, I'd be happy to go back to it. Uh, what I would like to discuss, though, are the, I, I, I said that the way to decide on which voting rule to use is to first decide what you want out of a voting rule, to decide what properties or what axioms you want the voting rule to satisfy. Well, uh, let, let's go through some of those properties. Uh, I think, again, if you, are, if you are an economist, you will be familiar with, with most of these already. So, so one idea, it's, it's called the Pareto property, is, is very simple, very intuitive. It just says that if everybody, if everybody prefers candidate X to candidate Y, and candidate X is on the ballot, then we shouldn't elect Y. It would be very foolish to elect Y if everybody prefers X, and X is actually a candidate. So, so very hard to argue against the Pareto property. Uh, Another property uh, which is very hard to argue with is the principle of anonymity. Formally speaking, what anonymity says is that if we have a profile and now we give voter I's preferences to voter J and we give voter J's preferences to voter K and so on, in other words, we do a permutation of preferences, we should still get the same winner because the distribution of votes is the same. We've just changed which voter has which vote. Uh, but if, if, if a system is anonymous, it shouldn't matter what the names of the voters are. All that should matter is the, are the votes. Uh, that's what anonymity says. Uh, and again, in a democratic society, it's very hard to argue that some voters should count for more than other voters. Uh, we want all voters to count equally. Well, that's what anonymity says. Um, and and you, you can see the formal definition, but the formal definition, uh, well, the formal definition looks more complicated than, than its actual conceptual meaning. Uh, well, just as we want a voting rule to treat all candidates equally, we also, uh, sorry, all, all voters equally, we want, uh, we want the voting rule to treat all candidates equally. And that's, and that's what this next property, neutrality, says. Neutrality says that if we um, hold an election and now... Uh, we, uh, we permute the names of the candidates. So we give candidate I's name to candidate J, and we give J's name to candidate K, and so on. What we should do is to permute the name of the winning candidate in the same way. So if I was the winner before, 
but we've given I's name to J, now J should be the winner. All, all this is saying is that, that all candidates should be on an equal, on an equal footing. So candidates are tr treated symmetrically. Well, it turns out that um, all of the voting rules that I've talked about, plurality rule, majority rule, rank order, uh, oh, I left out, uh, I left out uh, runoff voting, but that satisfies this too. Runoff voting, utilitarian voting, all, all of them satisfy the, pr the three principles I've talked about so far, Pareto, anonymity, and neutrality. Uh, but that will not be true of the next axiom. The next axiom is the most controversial of all of the axioms that I will be discussing. Um, nevertheless, it has a very good pedigree. It, it, it has a very good history because um, it, it was proposed by two of the giants from the field in, in somewhat different forms. It was proposed by Arrow and it was proposed by Nash. Uh, and if those two uh, say it's a good idea, it's probably a good idea. But l l let, me, let me describe the, the Nash formulation. Uh, but by the way, the name of the, the, name of the property uh, is independence of irrelevance. Candidates are independent, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Um, were just independents. Uh, and, and here's how it works. If, suppose we hold an election and X is the winner. But now let's omit from the ballot some of the candidates who didn't win. So we go from ballot Y to a smaller ballot Y prime, where, we, where some of the non-winning candidates are no longer on the ballots, but, but X is still on the ballots. Well, if X won with, on the big ballots, X should win on the smaller ballot. That's what independence of irrelevant candidates say, says. It, the, 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 the irrelevant candidates, the candidates who didn't win, shouldn't change the outcome by dropping out. So, so the, uh, this is the formal statement. Now, it turns out that not all of the voting rules that I've talked about uh, satisfy uh, this independence condition. Uh, and in particular, plurality rule which is used in the United States fails to satisfy independence. And uh, runoff voting, which is used in France, uh, fails to satisfy the independence condition. And we saw two spectacular failures of independence in recent elections in the United States and France. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember these elections, although they are relatively recent. In, in, the, in the 2000 U.S. presidential election, there were three candidates of, of interest. There, there was the candidate who won, George W. Bush. He became president. There, there was another major candidate, Al Gore, who almost became president. He came very close. And there was a third candidate uh, named Ralph Nader who made it possible for Bush to win rather than Gore. What happened was um, the election was so close that there was just one state, Florida, which determined everything. And uh, Gore, um, Bush got slightly more votes in Florida than Gore did, so, so Bush won. But, um, the reason Bush got more votes was that 
a lot of people in Florida voted for Nader. Almost 100,000 voters in Florida voted for Nader. We know that those voters almost certainly would have voted for Gore had Nader not been on the ballots. And if they had voted for Gore, Gore would have won. Uh, so the fact that Gore was, uh, that, that Nader was on the ballot changed the outcome of the election. That's a violation of, of independence, a very important violation, because it meant that uh, it meant that Nader spoiled the election for, for Gore. Uh, well, something very similar happened in the 2002 French presidential election. Jean-Marie Le Pen, a, a candidate from the far right, uh, spoiled the election for Lionel Jospin. Uh, and I, I won't go into the details there, but uh, if, if you're interested in, uh, in that election, it's very interesting as, as, a, um, as a danger for what might happen in Brazil uh, if you continue to use the current system, which is uh, runoff voting. Um, so uh, plurality rule, runoff voting, and for that matter, the board account all violates independence. Majority rule and utilitarianism satisfy independence. So, 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 so why does majority rule satisfy independence? If, if candidate A is the majority winner, that means that candidate A beats each other candidate by a majority. If some of those other candidates drop out Candidate A still beats the remaining candidates by a majority. So, so majority rule satisfies independence. And utilitarianism satisfies independence because if candidate A maximizes the sum of utilities on a big set, it will also maximize the sum of utilities on a, on a subset. Uh, so, so here are some more examples of violations of independence, but I don't think I need to go through them. Um, but now we come to, to the final axiom, which is actually the one that I talked about in my introduction, which is non-manipulability. Um, so I said that non-manipulability means that voters should have the incentive to vote honestly and not, not strategically. Uh, and formally, that says that um, there is no group of players, no coalition of players, C, who uh, do better if they send in utilities which are not correct. Uh, so, so let's suppose that if they send in their correct utilities, their true utilities, we get the outcome X. If they send in these manipulated utilities, we get the outcome x prime. It should not be the case that everybody in the coalition gains uh, from the manipulation. In other words, there should be at least one voter who likes x better than x prime. Otherwise, the coalition would have the incentive to manipulate. So that's, that's non-manipulability. Well, uh, Non-manipulability um, implies that a voting rule should be ordinal. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that the utility numbers that the utility function assigns don't matter. All that matters is the ranking, the ordinal ranking of candidates. Uh, not, if, if a voting rule is cardinal in the sense that the utility numbers matter, then the voting rule is necessarily manipulable. Say, say there are just two candidates running, X and Y. If, if, the voting num if the utility numbers matter and I want X to win, what I can do is to exaggerate how much utility I get from X and understate how much utility I get from Y, and I, will, I might be able to change the outcome. Uh, 
So utilitarianism is highly manipulable, uh, even in a two-candidate election. And that, I think, is the main reason why, in practice, we do not use utilitarianism as a voting rule. Um, the problem The problem is that majority rule also violates non-manipulability. But majority rule violates non-manipulability in a much more subtle way. And, and, and let me explain what I mean. Um, the problem with majority rule, the contrasse method, is that it's not always uh, well-defined. Uh, and, and this is something, actually, that Condorcet himself pointed out. Uh, here is an example of where majority rule is not uh, well-defined. Uh, let's imagine that society breaks down into three groups. 35% uh, of the population likes candidate X the most, then Y, then Z. 33% like Y the most, then Z, then X, and the remaining 32% have the ranking Z, X, Y. Well, who is the majority winner? Uh, there's no majority winner, because notice that uh, Y cannot be, candidate Y cannot be the majority winner, because a majority of people prefer X to Y. Uh, these people prefer X to Y, and these people prefer X to Y, and they're 67% uh, of the population. So Y cannot be the majority winner, but X cannot be the majority winner because uh, Z is preferred by majority to, to X. These people prefer Z to X. These people prefer Z to X. So X can't be the majority winner. But, but Z can't be the majority winner either, because a majority prefer Y to Z. These people prefer Y to Z, and these people prefer Y to Z. So there's no majority winner. <clears throat> and that means that if we use majority rule, we have to have a tie-breaking rule to say what happens if this situation arises. Now, actually, it turns out that this situation is not very likely in practice, at least in political elections. But nevertheless, we, we have to say what would happen if it occurred. Now, one, th one thing we can do is to, is to use the border rule. That's, that's where we assign points in cases of a tie. So this is what's called Black's method. The political scientist Black said we should use Condorcet if there is a Condorcet winner, if, 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 that's, if it's well defined, but we should use Borda otherwise. Um, the problem is that once we use Black's method or actually any other tie breaking rule, um, we, make, we make the Condorcet method vulnerable to manipulation. And, and, and I'll give you an example. So, so here, this is the same example that I looked at up here. We said that there is no majority winner, uh, but there is a, uh, a border winner. The border winner uh, is, is X. You, you can calculate that X would win when we start assigning points to the, to the different candidates. <clears throat> but it's manipulable, because if these people, the people in the middle, misrepresent their preferences, their, their true preferences are Y, Z, X. If they say that their preferences are Z, Y, X, then candidate Z becomes the majority winner. And these people prefer Z to X. So they would rather have Z than X. So they, they have an incentive to misrepresent. So majority rule is manipulable, too. Uh, so all of the voting methods I've mentioned violate at least one of the axioms. I mentioned plurality rule, majority rule, uh, runoff voting, border voting, and utilitarianism. They all vote. They all violate at least one of the axioms. So we might ask, well, is there some other voting rule that I haven't mentioned 
which satisfies these axioms? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, and actually, that's, that's uh, essentially the gibbard satterthwaite result, which I mentioned at the beginning. The gibbard satterthwaite theorem implies that there is no voting rule which satisfies all of these nice properties. Uh, I, w I won't... Uh, I, I, I won't go into more detail except to say that, as I said at the beginning, this is an overly pessimistic view because it worries about getting a desirable outcome in all conceivable circumstances, even though some of those circumstances, some of those rankings might be very unlikely. So. Uh, let, let, let me show, show you what I mean. Majority rule, the Condorcet method, turns out to satisfy all of the axioms, all five axioms, as long as this situation that I've described here does not occur, as long as we don't have what is called a Condorcet cycle. Uh, well, when can we rule out such a cycle? Well, there are some very natural cases where we, where we can rule this out. One case is where preferences are single peaked. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, voters have some ideological identification. Uh, and in the 2000 US presidential election, I mentioned the three candidates Nader, Gore, Bush. Nader was on the left wing, Bush was on the right wing, Gore was somewhere in between. Most voters in that election, if they, if they liked Bush the most, they were not going to like Nader second because Nader was on the opposite extreme from Bush. And if they liked Nader the best, they weren't going to put Bush seconds because Bush was on the opposite extreme from Nader. So as, as, as long as we can rule out this strange kind of preference, it turns out that majority rule satisfies all five properties. It's not, it's not manipulable. Um, and uh, I won't go into it, but uh, in, in the French election, it, it turns out that the problem from the theoretical point of view was that uh, Le Pen was a uh, polarizing candidate. People either loved him or hated him, uh, which, which was bad from the, from the standpoint of French society, but is actually very good for majority rule. Uh, majority rule satisfies all five properties if there's a candidate that people feel strongly about. But all of this suggests that what we should be doing is looking not at all possible rankings, not at all possible preferences that voters might have, but at restricted uh, classes of rankings. We'll, we'll say that a voting rule works well for a domain of rankings if it satisfies all five properties when uh, utility functions are limited to that domain. So, for example, uh, the Condorcet voting rule, the majority rule voting rule, uh, works well when voters are uh, ideological. Um, and now we come to the heart of the paper. Or there, there are two, two results in this paper, uh, appropriately labeled Theorem 1 and Theorem 2. Uh, here, here is theorem one, and, and this is why I said that majority rule, the Condorcet method, is one of the heroes of this story. Because as you will see, in theorem one, Condorcet dominates any other voting rule. So, so the idea is start with some, some voting rule, any voting rule you like, F, which happens to work well on a particular domain of preferences. 
well, if F works well on a domain of preferences, then majority rule must work well on that same domain. Furthermore, if F differs from majority rule, if F is not majority rule itself, then there must be a domain where majority rule works well and the, vo and the other voting rule does not. So what I'm saying is that there is a sense in which majority rule is dominant. If, if some other voting rule works well in some circumstances, majority rule must also work well in those circumstances. And furthermore, there will be circumstances where majority rule works well and the other voting rule does not. So that is, uh, that's the first result. And uh, I won't go into the details of the proof, uh, but you can, you can uh, check. Uh, 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 Dasgupta and I have a, a paper from, uh, from 2008. Which, uh, which establishes uh, this result. Uh, what I want to spend the rest of the time on is the case where we drop the independence condition. So I said that independence, uh, which is the requirement that there shouldn't be a spoiler, is the most controversial axiom. Um, it has the backing of Arrow and Nash, which is good, but nevertheless, when uh, voting theorists discuss the axioms that I've talked about, they unanimously agree on the other axioms, but not everyone says that independence is as compelling. Uh, and so it's interesting to explore what happens when we drop independence. Uh, so, so that's what I want to do. Well, if we, if we if we just drop independence, uh, but we look at all possible preferences, then we get an impossibility theorem just as before. This, once again, is, is the Gibbard Satterthwaite theorem. So what I propose doing is the same thing that we did uh, for the case where we, where we assume independence, namely to look at limited or restricted classes of preferences. And, we, and I already used the term working well, so now I'll use the term working nicely. It will say that a voting rule works nicely for a domain if it satisfies the remaining four conditions. So that's Pareto, anonymity, neutrality, and non-manipulability. Uh, and once again, we get a domination result, but it's, it's, it's actually uh, not e exactly the same as the domination result we got in theorem one, because now there's another voting rule that emerges, and it's the board accounts. Uh, so Condorcet, what, it turns out that Condorcet and Borda together dominate all other voting rules. Neither one does so on, it, on its own. You need the two together. And, 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 and let me ex explain this, how this theorem works. Let's, let's take some vo any voting rule you like, which works nicely for a particular domain of preferences then it has to be true that either Condorcet or Borda, or perhaps both of them, works nicely on that same domain. Furthermore, there will exist some other domain where either Condorcet or Borda works nicely, but F does not. Uh, 
No, I, 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 I'm not mixing them. I, I'm keep one, one or the other will is guaranteed to to dominate any other voting rule. We and, and which one does the domination will depend on how we restrict preferences. So so I'm not I'm not going to prove this. I'm not really going to give a proof for this, but let me explain the idea. M majority rule works well as long as there are no Condorcet cycles. Condorcet cycles are th those situations where some group has preference X, Y, Z, another Y, Z, X, a third Z, X, Y. So uh, majority rule works nicely when we eliminate Condorcet cycles. Interestingly, Borda works nicely precisely when we have Condorcet cycles. That's, that's the only case where it works nicely, when we have a Condorcet cycle or a subset of a Condorcet cycle. So the two complement each other uh, in, 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 a, in a very uh, uh, interesting way. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's how we get this joint domination. So neither on its own is, is sufficient. Well, what I, what I find is uh, interestingly, there, there's an interesting historical point to make. I said that um, the Condorcet method was discovered over 200 years ago, or developed over 200 years ago by Condorcet. Actually, Borda was almost an exact contemporary of uh, Condorcet in France. Uh, and uh, he, uh, and the two knew each other. And, and they fought over which method was better. Um, Condorcet, of course, said the Condorcet method was better. Borda argued for the Borda count. And as a result of this conflict, those two voting methods are by far the most studied voting methods of any in the literature. And some, some people uh, support Condorcet, some, some support Borda. But what Theorem 2 shows is that they were both right, because in some sense you need both of them. At least if you don't insist on independence, uh, there will be some circumstances where Condorcet works nicely. There will be some circumstances where Borda works nicely. Um, you need both of them uh, to cover all the territory. And with that uh, historical observation, let me thank you for your attention.